You would kindly return to your seats. Our sermon this morning is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 48. If you will turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 48. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him take your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. O Holy Spirit, who inspired the words, of this text that we read this morning, I pray that you will illuminate our hearts and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. You must have seen my sermon title, Love When You're Hated, and perhaps thinking, some of you probably, good sermon title but hard to do. That reminds me of a psychology professor who did not have any kids. And when he would see his neighbor scolding his child, he would say, you should love your boy, not punish him. One hot afternoon, this uh, professor, he was uh, kind of uh, repairing the concrete that was leading to his driveway. And after he finished his hard work, he was just you know, wiping the sweat from his bro. And he was walking towards his house. And suddenly he saw one young, naughty boy coming and putting his foot on this fresh cement. Immediately he went, he grabbed the kid and he was about to spank him and one neighbor said, Professor, don't you know you should love the boy? And he yelled back and he said, I do love him in the abstract but not in the concrete. <laughs> it is indeed a hard teaching that you're going to hear this morning. And not only is it hard, it is really counterintuitive. It is countercultural. I also remember times when I have been wronged and there was an opportunity for me to get back and that is what I did. I responded back in the way that the person had responded to me. Tit for tat, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And the worst of all is this, at that time, I did not feel guilty about it. I did not feel any kind of remorse because I felt I was done wrong and it was right for me to hit back, it was right for me to give back. And that is what I realize is what we learn from our culture. It's my right to be treated well. Am I supposed to be a doormat? Is it not okay to give back when I'm not treated, when I'm wronged? And all these feelings and all these statements are not wrong by itself, but it's the reaction that is often wrong. So this morning what we're hearing from the text is completely counter-cultural, completely contrary to our basic nature. And Jesus is saying, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Again in verse 43 he says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies. Before we go into the teaching of Jesus, I just want to clarify what the interpretation of the Pharisees was. Oftentimes, uh, we think that Jesus is trying to probably correct the Old Testament teaching. But I just want to bring to your attention what the Old Testament teaches about this. 
If you go to Exodus, Exodus, sorry, Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 to 25, from where the scripture is quoted, it says, if people are fighting and they hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely then there is a, and, and there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined, whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is a serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Similarly, Leviticus chapter 24, verses 17 to 20, it says, Anyone who takes the life of a human being is to be put to death. Anyone who takes the life of someone's animal must make restitution, life for life. Anyone who injures their neighbor is to be injured in the same manner, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The one who has inflicted the injury must suffer the same injury. If you carefully look at the scripture portions, the commandment or the law that God gave was not to take personal revenge. The commandment that is given here means that you have to give a punishment that is equitable to the, to the, to the crime that has been committed. So as we read in this verse, so if the offender has done something that is not, not such a serious issue, you have to fight him. But if he does something that is serious, if he takes somebody's life, then you have to take his life. So it was a law that was put in place so that the accused would be protected from multiple acts of revenge. It was a way of limiting the degree of revenge or personal revenge that one may take upon somebody else. The, the teaching that eye for eye was not supposed to be taken literally. It was not that it was not promoting mutilation as the punishment for the offender, but it was a formula for punishment or compensation that was proportionate to the crime. In the time of that, of, of that ancient time, it was a just law, it was a just commandment saying that the punishment that you give to somebody is not to be based on personal revenge, but it has to be based on the degree of the issue or the degree of the crime. And also to, to note that this Old Testament law was given to, to guide the judges in assessing what the nature of the crime was and what the damage was and what the appropriate punishment would be. It was not something that would guide interpersonal relationships. It was not something to affirm or promote personal revenge. Many times people think that when they read this text that the Old Testament, uh, it's, that it's, a, it's a, probably an evidence of vengeful nature of justice in the Hebrew Bible, but that is not true. What God is doing here is promoting something that is ju just. But the sad part is that the Pharisees, they extended this principle and they applied this principle to teach that it was okay to take personal revenge. So they extended this teaching which was supposed to be limited to the, to the courts, to the realm of personal relationships. And actually if you look at our, 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 our culture today, if you look around, I think that is how we interpret these words even today. I was uh, reading about a, a movie called Eye for an Eye. I don't think it's a very popular movie. I, I've never seen it. But I was just reading the summary of what the content was. And it was talking about this woman who's, whose daughter was raped and she was murdered. And the guy who murdered him was sent to jail. But he was, he was released on, on, on technicality. And when this woman heard that she was, he was released on technicality, she took things in her own hand. So she started taking course in self-defense and she became an expert marksman and with a pistol she, she set out to ki kill the person who killed her daughter. And that is the kind of culture that we live in. We, we do not feel that it is wrong to take personal revenge, particularly when somebody wrongs us. And that is what we hear. And Jesus is saying, you have heard it said, but let me tell you something that is different. You shall not do evil. In the same manner, the second uh, text that we read, we have heard it was said, love your neighbor but hate your enemies. Let me show you what the Old Testament was uh, uh, teaching was. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 to 18. It says, do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so that you will not share in their guilt. Do not take revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And in the same chapter, in chapter 19, verse 34, it says, You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him 
as yourself. So even the Old Testament, the commandment of God was to love fellow beings, to love their own people, to love the alien who was living among them. There are many other passages in the Old Testament which indicate that God hates evil. And hence the psalmist says in Psalm 139, Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise, rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them as my enemies. So the, the, the Pharisees extended this teaching of, of the Old Testament to love your neighbor and said that it is okay to hate their enemies. But here in this passage, even in Psalms, David, who, is, who wrote the psalm, is not speaking about personal animosity. Instead, he's talking as a representative of God and he's actually talking against evil. And he's, in the same psalm, he says, Search my heart, O God, and see if there is any wickedness in me. But the Qumranites and the, the Pharisees, they twisted the scripture portion and they said that it was okay to hate those who were regarded as enemies. And we live in a time when that is what we will hear from our peers. That is what we will hear from the, from the movies and from the media. That is what we will hear from, from people around us that it is okay to take revenge when you've been wrong. It is okay to hurt somebody else when you've been hurt. But Jesus says, you have heard it say, but I say to you, love your enemies. So what Jesus is doing is not that he is, he is canceling or annulling the Old Testament the law, but what he is doing is he is giving a proper interpretation of the Old Testament. Jesus is not correcting the Old Testament, but he is correcting the misunderstanding about the Old Testament application. Jesus says that I have come to fulfill the Old Testament. I have come to fulfill the law. So instead of, of, of cancelling the Old Testament, Jesus is raising the bar and he is saying that the righteousness of the disciples of the kingdom of God must exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes. It must exceed what you hear in the world. It must exceed what you hear in the culture. The rabbis were following the letter of the law, but Jesus was showing them that they were forgetting the spirit of the law. That they were forgetting the truest meaning of the law. Jesus was trying to teach them that, that what you need is a transformation of the heart and then the actions that flow out of a transformed heart. So first of all, the interpretation of the Pharisees or the interpretation of the world is totally contrary to the heart of God. It's totally contrary to the spirit with which the law was given. And so Jesus is correcting this misunderstanding. And listen to the instruction of Jesus. It says, But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. When someone strikes you in the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if when someone wants to sue you, take a tunic, let him take your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Jesus is giving a new standard for the disciples of this new kingdom. He is saying, do not render evil for evil. Evil deed is in view here. And first of all, he's saying that you cannot retaliate back. Not only that, he's saying you have to comply with even the unreasonable requests of the people. And finally, to show charity to everybody. He's saying that when somebody strikes you on the, on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So, I want you to imagine the picture. If you're standing like this, if I do strike you on your, on your right cheek, I would strike you like this. It was the highest form of insult of that time. And Jesus is saying that even when somebody is insulting you like that, you have to turn to him, the other one also. And if somebody were to take the tunic, which is the inner, inner coat that the people of that time would wear, Jesus is saying, give him the outer coat as well. Jesus is saying that you have to give up something that is so indispensable. The outer coat was something that the poor of that time would use as, as a covering for, for the night. But Jesus is saying, if somebody takes the inner coat, give him the outer coat as well. And if somebody were to force you to go one mile, this is talking about the military of that time, like how Simon the Siren was forced to do something. He says, if you're forced to go one mile, go two miles. Not only that, give to one who asks, asks and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. And the pattern to this is found in Luke chapter 6, verses, 6, verses 34 to 35, where it says, Lend even to enemies without expecting anything in return. So the teaching of Jesus Christ is so radical. He's saying that you cannot take revenge. Simply said, do not take personal revenge. He's saying that he's going to the heart of the Old Testament law. 
that you cannot take personal revenge on somebody who hurts you. Not only that, you have to sacrifice your rights. You might be saying, it is my right to be treated well. Am I supposed to be a doorman? But God is saying, you are not supposed to take personal revenge. You must have heard about this, um, a guy who was kind of bitten by a rabid dog. And he goes to the doctor and the physician says that, uh, you have rabies? Uh, rabies. Upon hearing this, some of the A and the words that we say in India are pronounced differently. So, uh, upon hearing this, the, the patient immediately, you know, he pulled out a pad and started writing something. So the doctor said to him, you know that there is cure for rabies, you will not die. Uh, he said, yeah, yeah, I know that. I'm just making a list of people I would like to bite. <laughs> you know, that is the normal tendency that we have. We want to hurt back people who hurt us. And it could be an employer who has wronged you or insulted you at a meeting. It could, be, it could be somebody who has abused you in your childhood. It could be a teacher who has been unfair and graded you down. It could be a spouse who has been disrespectful to you. It could be a friend who has, uh, who has defied your confidence and who is saying bad things about you. Whatever it is, God is saying that there is no place for personal revenge. Even when you are mistreated, there is no place for personal revenge. And we read this morning about David. Even though he was, he was mistreated, even though Saul was trying to kill him, he makes up a firm decision in his heart that he was not going to do wrong. You might wonder, does that make sense? Am I supposed to be a doormat? Am I supposed to just lie down and let him run his tracks over me? Don't I have my rights? Am I just a weak person? You know, the culture teaches us that it is weak to not respond back. But the Bible teaches that it takes a strong man. It takes a strong man to be able to control himself. It takes a strong man to be able to love somebody and not be able to respond back. And you have to remember that Jesus is talking here about personal ethics. He is not saying that the government is not supposed to protect the borders, but he's saying that there is no place for personal vengeance. So he's talking about a passive non-retaliation. But it is not simply passive non-retaliation. Jesus says in verse 43, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This love that Jesus is talking about here is not some warm fuzzy feeling. It's not about some emotion that Jesus is talking here about. But it's talking about volitional acts for the benefit and well-being of others. You will see the same parallel word, words in, 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 in uh, Luke chapter 6, 27. It says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21 to 22. If your enemy is hungry... Give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward him. You see, for the Pharisees of that time, the neighbor meant somebody who was like them. The neighbor was the Jew and the enemy was everybody who was not like them. The Gentile was an enemy for them. That's why we read in the story of the Good Samaritan about how the religious people treated those who were not like them, the non-Jews. But Jesus is giving a radical teaching here. He saying, love your enemies. Do good to those who do harm to you. And this love has to be expressed in good deeds. Not only in good deeds, but in good words. The same chapter, Luke 6 says, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. To bless somebody would mean to speak well of somebody. It's difficult to speak well of somebody who is speaking ill of us. I read about, I read about uh, one general named Robert Lee. He was asked his opinion of a fellow officer who had made some, some uh, bad remarks about him. And Lee said that he's a good guy. And the person who was asking the question said, General, probably you don't know what he's talking about you. He said, I know. But I was, not asked, my I was asked my opinion of him not his opinion of me. We are supposed to speak good, to bless those who hurt us. Not only that, Jesus says, pray for them as well. Pray for your enemies. You know, praying for somebody who has hurt you, praying for somebody who has harmed you, is probably the highest form of love that you can show for somebody. It is not possible to go before your father and pray for somebody if you do not love him or her. And oftentimes when we pray, we pray, Lord, change him. Or we pray, Lord, you know, 
take care of him, like we would tell uh, some kind of bully, just take care of him. But often I realize that when you go to pray for somebody who has hurt you, the first change that will happen is not in the other person, but oftentimes the change starts happening in us. When we kneel before the Father and we pray, Lord, change him or change the situation, oftentimes I've seen that Lord starts working in our own hearts and he starts changing us. And guess what? When your heart is changed and when your actions are changed, the other person starts changing too. And that's what we read in the story of David and, and Saul. David, even though he was wrong, he was kind to Saul. He did not kill Saul. And in the end, Saul was weeping and he's saying, you are so much, so much more righteous than me. <clears throat> Oftentimes, if you want to see a change in the person who has hurt you, it probably begins with a change in yourself. And let me say this, if you pray for somebody, God has the power to change the other person. But even if the other person has not changed because of a strong will or because of a bad character, let me tell you that you can have a clear conscience before God. You will have the joy of knowing that you did not harm the other person. You will have the joy of knowing that you have forgiven the other person. So Jesus is saying, love and forgive those who do not deserve it. Even the people who hate you, even the people who hurt you, even your very enemies, love them and forgive them. The very people who do not deserve it. Now you might be wondering, you know, how can I do that? How is it possible? How can I love somebody who hurts me? And Jesus gives us some indication to that. He says in verse 45, 45, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He says you have to imitate the father. You have to look at the heart of the father. He is good both to the good and to the bad. He is just both to the just and the unjust. The foundation for this radical teaching is based on the goodness and the justice of the father himself. Many times our response is based on what we feel about it. If we feel that we are right and the other person is wrong. We feel that we are righteous and the other person is unrighteous. But God is saying, or Jesus is saying, that your response has to be based on the character of God. It has to be rooted in the goodness and justice of God. You know, one of the major arguments about against the goodness of God, in fact, the very existence of God, is that if there is evil, why is there good? Sorry, if, uh, sorry. Why is there evil if God is good? I want to ask it in a different way. Why is there good? even when people are evil. Why is there good? Why do good things happen to bad people? And the Bible gives us the answer, because God is good. Because God is inherently good. He sends His blessings upon both the good and the evil, the just and the unjust. And, the, and Jesus is saying, imitate the Father so that you may be the sons of the Father. God has called you and me to be disciples of this radical kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying, imitate the Father so that you may be the sons of the Father. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of the darkness into his, mercy, into his marvelous light. See, the demands, the ethical demands of the kingdom of God is not for everybody. It is for the disciples of Jesus Christ. At the beginning of the sermon, we saw that Jesus was calling his disciples and he's giving them this new radical teaching. He's saying, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who hunger. The good news of the kingdom of God has come to the one who is unworthy, to the one who least expects it, the one who is, who is powerless, the one who is oppressed, the one who is grieving, the humble. And Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God has been given to the one who is unworthy, the one who is undeserving. And hence, because the Father has loved you, me, totally unworthy, totally undeserving, may we imitate the Father. The way of showing the love of the Father, the way He has shown His generosity to us and to everybody else is both good and bad. Jesus wants us to imitate that and be able to show the love of the Father. You see, it is not based on our own strength. We have to recognize this. 
The God, the Father, has loved us first. He has ushered us into the kingdom of God. He had made us his disciples. And Jesus is saying, this is how the people, people of the kingdom of God will look like. They will not take revenge. They will not repay evil for evil. Instead, they will love their enemies. It is because the Father has loved us. It is because the Father has called us the one who is undeserving, the one who is unworthy to be his disciple. That now, we show that we are the sons of the Father through our lives and through our actions. We can decide not to take personal revenge because our character and our actions should be based and rooted in the goodness and justice of God. And when you recognize that we, our God is good and just, we don't have to take things in our own hands. You know, Romans says, Romans chapter 12, verses 17 to 18, Repay no one evil for evil. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You see, we typically try to take things in our own hands. But if my God is good, and if my God is just, you can put your confidence in the Lord, knowing that He is the one who will repay. Probably not the way you want, probably not at the time when you want, but when the time is appropriate. It could be in the next life. He will repay for every evil action. But until then, as disciples of God, we are to imitate the character of the Father. We are to be like the Father. It goes on to say, as if, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You know, it's human nature. I, I like to love people who love me. It's human nature. We like people who like us. We love people who love us. And when people hurt us, we just want to hurt them. But Jesus is saying, how are you my disciple? How are you different from anybody else in the world? That's, that's what the pagans do. That's what poor people who do not know about the kingdom of God do. But your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the world. Your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. You might wonder how is it, how is it supposed to exceed? What is this extra or plus that God is talking about? And I read about this uh, German theologian Bonhoeffer. It says, it is the love of Jesus Christ himself who patiently and obedient to the cross. The cross is the differential of the Christian religion. The plus that we talk about, the exceeding love that we talk about is really the love of Jesus Christ. When people hurt him, when people spat on his face, when people insulted him, he did not revile, but he gave himself into the hands of the Father who judges justly. He did not consider equality with his Father, but he gave up his rights. And one day God raised him up and gave him a name that is above every other name. We are called to be perfect, like the Father is perfect. Perfection indicates a level of spiritual maturity that you have achieved. And the goal of that spiritual maturity is becoming like the Father. Is becoming like the good and the just Father who has called us into the kingdom of God. It, it provides a logical conclusion of all the teaching that Jesus is giving here. It, it can be summed up in just two things. Love God and love your neighbor. And that love has to extend even to the people who love, who hate you, even to the enemies. And Jesus is saying, this kind of unrestricted, unrestricted love is the love of the Father. Because He first loved us, we love Him and we love others. And when we have that kind of a life, when we have that kind of a character, it's going to surprise people. It will shine like a, like a light in the darkness. And it will glorify the name of the Father. If there is anything that will draw people unto the Father, it is you and I. It is our lives. This is the goal of every Christian that God is calling to. To be perfect like the Father. And we have to recognize that on this, earth, on this side of life, probably we will never achieve perfection. We will be perfect when we see Him face to face. But this is the goal that we have for our lives. That we will be like the Father. The Father who loved us unconditionally. The Father who looked at us even when we were unworthy or undeserving. The Father who has ushered us into the kingdom of God. And now is saying, 
imitate the Father and be just as the Father is. There is no place for personal revenge. There is no place to hurt somebody when you are hurt. Because he did not do it to us. The Bible calls us enemies of the cross. Even though we were his enemies in our former life, he has loved us. I think it would be helpful for us to just focus and meditate on the love of the Father. And I think it will change a little bit our perspective on how we should love others. There have been often times in my life when I have been hurt. When I felt isolated or, or lonely. But this is what I've learned during those moments. I've really understood deeper the love of God. Even in those moments when I was, when I was alone, it was in those moments that I really understood the love of God. And when I understood the love of God, it is helping me not to be judgmental of others. It is helping me to love others. And when I love others, I believe that they will change because I'm loving them. It's kind of a chain reaction, but it all starts with realizing that the Father is just, that the Father is good. So every morning when you get up on, every morning when you get up to pray, let us remember how much the Lord has loved us. Every time we gather around the table to celebrate the love of Jesus Christ who died for us on the cross of Calvary. This morning if you've been hurt, if, if you're harboring anger and bitterness in your heart, maybe you have to do a kind of check up before God. We go to the doctors every year to do a, a physical check up. Maybe we should do a spiritual check up. If you're feeling a, a, a attitude of revenge and, and wanting to hurt somebody, maybe there is something wrong in you. Maybe the other person is wrong, there is no doubt about it. However, maybe there is something wrong with you as well. It's a time to assess and check ourselves before God. And if you're a person who has hurt somebody else and God is speaking to you this morning, maybe it is a time to repent before Him. Because He has loved us so much. And let me say this morning, if there are some, some of you who have never understood the love of the Father, the love of Jesus Christ. He loves you unconditionally. Regardless of your past, regardless of whether you are good or evil, He loves you just the way you are. And if you have never received Jesus Christ into your life, let me invite you to welcome Him, welcome him into your life. You will never regret it because He loves you so much. More than any, any other person in the world can give you, He loves you. He gave Himself up for you. So as we conclude this morning with this song, I Surrender All, I want to invite you to stand before God and search your heart. Search my heart, O oh God, and see if there is any wickedness in me. And if you need strength to forgive somebody, to love somebody, maybe confess that before God. And if you have never known Christ as your Savior, I welcome you to come forward. I'm going to invite the deacons to come forward. If you need prayer, please share it with one of our elders and they will pray with you.